I'd been to Area 51. I didn't see any flying saucers or anything like that. What did you see? <laughs> I saw uh, Defense Department uh, uh, experiments being performed and, and training activities and that sort of thing. Nothing that the taxpayer would uh, uh, object to. But, of course um, not. But it's a big range. There's a lot of stuff going on out there, and there's right. a lot of adjacent ranges. Uh, if you look at the Area map, actually. Four, where he was. That's what he said, yeah. yeah. That's what um, he said. Can you give me the names and titles of the people with direct first-hand knowledge uh, and access to some of this crash retrieval, some of these crash retrieval programs, and maybe which facilities, military bases, that would the recovered material would be in? And I know a lot of Congress have talked about we're going to go to Area 51 and, you know, I mean, there's nothing there anymore anyway. It's just, you know, and we move like a glacier. And as soon as we announce it, I'm sure the moving vans would pull up, but please. Uh, I can't discuss that publicly, but I did provide that information both to the intel committees and the inspector general. And is directed to both of you, and we'll start with Lou. Lou, while you were in the government, and then this Sean, while you were in the government, have you ever come across the words element 115? Did you see it? Did you read it? Did you overhear someone allude to it? So first of all, Kurt, um, how you doing? You doing good? Good. Doing great. Good. Now that we've got that out of the way, Kurt, let's answer your question about element 115. Um, no. No. Um, there is obviously a lot of discussion about it in the uh, Twitterverse and social media, but that was never uh, a part of the the, the ATIP portfolio. Uh, doesn't mean it wasn't part of portfolios beforehand, or, or perhaps you know some other efforts uh, that were parallel or tangential to ATIP. But while I was in ATIP, Element One Fifteen wasn't ever really part of any type of discussion. Sean. I never, no, I never encountered anything like that. I wouldn't have, um, even if it were purportedly anything like what it's supposed to be. I've only heard about it in uh, the zeitgeist of ufology from the same sources. Well, I, I found his that? explanations curious. Um, yeah, how so? The, the complexity of it uh, and the fact that he talked about Laurentium, for example, and then decades later, it turns out that um, apparently there is a more stable form of that than that's element 115 i sounds right i couldn't yeah. tell you for but sure it's called laurentium laurentium bob lazar said he worked at a secret facility near groom lake where alien technology was being reverse engineered do you think bob lazar is full of shit so yeah, I, don't, I don't know if you have yeah, a take i mean i'm certainly uh different than him i came at it from a different angle. I have no information on Bob Lazar. It wasn't in the scope of my looking into it kind of activities. Yeah. If he actually ever experienced what he experienced, I literally have no idea. Okay, so regarding Bob Lazar, with respect to his claims, um, again, I have no way to adjudicate whether or not he actually you know, encountered this. I do have friends who are, and the people that I know who know his story, some know him, um, believe him. So I think, okay, this poor guy, Bob Lazar, <laughs> so many people, you know, this is what happens to people who have experiences like this. They're questioned, their reputations are put on the line, in some instances, their, their reputations are manipulated on purpose to make them look uncredible. Important for people not to know about. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can you, you just, just let, can we start at the beginning with your military career and just walk through what exactly your experiences were? I was in the drafted into the military and got into the U.S. Army. After that, I was sent to the Signal Training Center in Eastern United States. What year would this be? 58. I went through the Signal Training course, and at that time, I went through the Radio Teletype course and also the Cryptography course, Crypto. They had five instructors that were getting out of military service. So they pulled the top five students and I was third in the class. 
So I got pulled as an instructor. Now, were you at this time also working yet for CIA? No. Not yet? No. After one day, my boss came to me, and he uh, said, uh, how would you like to, you know, make some extra money? And I said, oh, money is good. <laughs> <laughs> so he explained to me that I could, he could put it through. I could, would have to get a top secret White House Q clearance for the job, you know. And I thought, boy, must be a pretty exclusive thing, you know. And I said, well, what is this? And he said that I'm director for the CIA for Eastern United States, you know. And I said, oh, I didn't know that. And he said, you weren't supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> After about six weeks, my security clearance came through and I got my CIA card. It was an ID card, like a credit card, where I could just go up to the door and slice it, walk right in. And my uh, name at that time, I used a mm -hmm. artificial name too. Never used my real name. I started working with him on the project he was on. And that was... Uh, Project Blue Book, which was kind of partially a fraud. Because You're saying some of the Blue Book cases were, yes. were completely fictitious? Yes. But the cases that we got came from, I think it was Fort Belleville, Maryland. Mm -hmm. Fort Belvoir? Yeah. And it didn't come from the Pentagon or it didn't come from CIA headquarters. But we would get reports about a certain sighting at the head in Mexico or Italy or something like that. And then we would have to, we had people that would follow through on it. They would go out and interview the people to see if they were not cases or if it was real, you know. So they'd be going overseas frequently? I, I wasn't, but... I always stayed statewide, but uh, uh, the people we had working with us from the CIA would do that. We would get like a new report probably a couple times a week. I was coming into the Army fresh off the farm, you know, so I really didn't have much knowledge of anything, but my boss filled me in on Project Blue Book and what they had found so far as far as uh, greys and aliens and, and the Roswell incident. How did you feel when this first got dumped on you? When you first well, learned about this? I was just kind of overwhelmed with all of this, you know. And I said to him, I don't know if I'm going to be able to be a judge of this type of thing. What's real, what's not, when I don't have much knowledge of it, you know. So... What did he say? He said, well, we have to build the information as we go, and you'll see how this thing is working out. And then the other thing is, of course, you really weren't able to tell family or, or close no, friends, obviously. No, I, I couldn't tell anybody. In fact, I, I had to take a vow that I wouldn't tell anybody a lot of it for 40 years and more of it for 50 years, which is up in 2010. You're doing all this crypto work. You're looking at images, photographs, video. It's 1958, maybe the fall of 58. What happened after this? At that time, the Project Blue Book thing kind of went pot, you know. If you remember, back in those days, they kind of declared it as a nothing, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, they were telling the world all UFOs are misidentifications, hoaxes, yeah, balloons, yeah, psychological issues, whatever. Yes. Yeah. 
So my boss came to me and he says, we've both got a new assignment. And he says, oh, I said, where are we going? Oh, he says, we're going to the Capitol. We're going to be part of the Eisenhower push. He's trying to find out something about all about these aliens that MJ-12 was supposed to find out but never did, never sent back reports to him. The MJ-12, the UFO you, control group, were they calling it MJ-12 yes, at that time? Yes. yes. They called us in, went into the old office, and Eisen, President Eisenhower was there and Nixon, and they said... Uh, we called the people in from MJ-12 from Area 51 and S-4, but uh, they told us that the government had no jurisdiction over what they were doing. So being a general, past general, you didn't tell them to go to hell without any <laughs> real good reason, you know? Mm -hmm. So he said... Uh, I want you and your boss to fly out there. I want you to give him a personal message. And he says, I want you to tell them, whoever is in charge, tell them that to get in, they have this week, coming week, to get into Washington and to report to me. And if they don't, I'm going to get the first army from Colorado, and we're going to go over, we're going to take the base over. I don't care what kind of classified material you got. We're going to rip this thing apart. Eisenhower was going to invade yes, Area, Area 51. 51. Yeah, with the 1st Army. So you go out with your superior. Yes. You fly out. You land. What happens? Can you describe this whole process? What you saw? They took us the... 13 or 15 miles south to S4 and like different garage door openings okay. and in these garage door openings they had like different saucer crafts the very first one had uh, the uh, Roswell craft in it was kind of crashed up but Apparently, every alien that was in a must car guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that security and liberty may prosper together. My name is Henry McElroy, Jr., a retiring former state representative from New Hampshire. Thank you for your attention to this brief message concerning the world's interaction with both Earth-based and off-world astronauts. The reason I am making this announcement is in the hopes of encouraging better perspective to all who explore the universe. Therefore, as a result, making a more valuable contribution to the humanity, to humanity for the benefit of all faiths, all races, and all nations. Another reason I am here today is because I believe in the foundational wisdom of our nation, which was laid down by our founding fathers, and because we know know that highly advanced knowledge and information can assist human beings in solving various problems 
both in current times and in our future. When I was in the New Hampshire State Legislature, I served on the State Federal Relations and Veterans Affairs Committee. It was apparently important that as a representative of the sovereign people who had elected me to this honorable office, that I be updated on a large number of topics related to the affairs of our people and our nation. As I understood it, some of those ongoing topics had been examined and categorized as federal, state, local development, and security matters. These documents related to various topics, some of which spanned decades of our nation's history. One of those recurring topics is the reason I am addressing you this evening. I would like to submit to our nation my personal testimony of one document related to one of these ongoing topics, which I saw while in office serving on the State Federal Relations and Veterans Affairs Committee. The document I saw was an official brief to President Eisenhower. To the best of my memory, this brief was pervaded with a sense of hope, and it informed President Eisenhower of the continued presence of extraterrestrial beings here in the United States of America. The brief seemed to indicate that a meeting between the president and some of these visitors could be arranged as appropriate if desired. The tone of the brief indicated to me that there was no need for concern since these visitors were in no way causing any harm or had any intention whatsoever of causing any disruption then or in the future. While I can't verify the times or places or that any meeting or meetings occurred directly between Eisenhower and these visitors, because of his optimism in his farewell address in 1961, I personally believe that Eisenhower did indeed meet with these extraterrestrial off-world astronauts. I hope my personal testimony will aid the nation in its quest for continued enlightenment. I am honored to follow in the footsteps of those who have come forward with their personal testimonies, those who deserve the admiration of the American people for sharing their accounts publicly in an effort to elevate our knowledge to a higher understanding of our existence. People such as former astronaut John Glenn, Edgar Mitchell, Gordon Cooper, and Buzz Aldrin, just to name a few. Former presidents Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter. Captain Bill Uhouse of the United States Marine Corps. Lieutenant Colonel John Williams of the United States Air Force. Colonel Philip Corso, Sr. of the United States Army. Commander Graham Bethune of the United States Navy along with David Hamilton of the De Department of Energy, Donna Hare of NASA, and James Coop of the National Security Agency. I would also like to thank the countries of France, Brazil, Britain, Russia, Italy, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, New Zealand, and our neighbor, 
to the north, Canada, Uruguay, and Australia for also opening their files to the citizens of their countries and allowing them access to information that is so very important to the evolution of humanity. I thank you for allowing me this opportunity to have a small part in doing the same by sharing the information I have given you today. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank our communications crew for helping us make this happen today. And I'd also like to authorize distribution of this video for anyone who wants to use it for educational purposes. And thank you. What special access programs cover this information and how is it possible that they have evaded oversight for so long? Uh, I do know the names. Once again, I can't discuss that publicly and, and how they've evaded oversight. I, in a close setting, I can tell you the specific tradecraft use. All right. When, did, when do you think those programs began and who authorized them? I do know a lot of that information, but that's something I can't discuss publicly. because since What level of security clearance is required to fully access these programs? Well, anybody who has... Uh, and, I, and I say that oh. because myself... Um, Representative Gates and Representative Luna were mm -hmm. basically turned away at one point mm -hmm. at Eglin. So please go right ahead. Uh, certainly, difference between member access and say somebody like me, but anybody who has a you know TSSCI clearance and meets the eligibility criteria, the access adjudicative authority should be able to grant you so, access. It, so who gets to decide this, in your opinion, in the past? Uh, it's a group of career uh, senior executive officials. Okay, are they government officials? Both or in and out. Do what? Both in and out of government, and that's about as far I as I can go there. Yeah. All right, well, that's, that leads to my next question. Which private corporations are directly involved in this program? Uh, the specific corporations I did provide uh, to the committees in specific divisions, and uh, I spent 11 and a half hours with both intel committees. Has the U.S. government become aware of actual evidence of extraterrestrial, otherwise unexplained forms of intelligence? And if so, when do you think this first occurred? Uh, I like to use the term non-human. I don't like to denote origin. Keeps the aperture open, both scientifically. Right. Uh, certainly, uh, like I've dis discussed publicly uh, previously, 1930s. Okay. So. Okay. Has there been any... Has there been an active U.S. government disinformation campaign to deny the existence of unidentified aerial phenomena? And if so, why? I can't go beyond what I've already espoused publicly about that. Under NSC-10-1 in 1976, an executive coordination group was established to review but not approve covert project proposals. The ECG was secretly tasked to coordinate the alien projects. NSC-10-1 and-2 were interpreted to mean that no one at the top wanted to know about anything until it was over and successful. These actions established a buffer between the president and the information. It was intended that this buffer serve as a means for the president to deny knowledge if leaks divulge the true state of affairs. This buffer was used in later years for the purpose of effectively isolating succeeding presidents from any knowledge of the alien presence other than what the secret government and intelligence community wanted them to know. NSC-10-2 established a study panel that met secretly and was made up of the scientific minds of the day. These NSC memos and secret executive orders set the stage for the creation of MJ-12 only four years later. Secretary of Defense James Forrestal objected to the secrecy. He was a very idealistic and religious man. He believed that the public should be told. James Forrestal was also one of the first known abductees. When he began to talk to the leaders of the opposition party and leaders of the Congress about the alien problem, he was asked to resign by Truman. He expressed his fears to many people. Rightfully, he believed that he was being watched. This was interpreted by those who were ignorant of the facts as paranoia. 
Forrestal later was said to have suffered a mental breakdown. He was ordered to the mental ward of Bethesda Naval Hospital. In spite of the fact that the administration had no authority to have him committed, the order was carried out. In fact, it was feared that Forrestal would begin to talk again. He had to be isolated and discredited. His friends and family were denied permission to visit. Finally, on May 21, 1949, Forrestal's brother made a fateful decision. He notified authorities that he intended to remove James from Bethesda on May 22nd. Sometime in the early morning of May 22nd, 1949, agents of the CIA tied a sheet around James Forrestal's neck, fastened the other end to a fixture in his room, and then threw James Forrestal out the window. The sheet tore, and he plummeted to his death. President Truman created the super-secret National Security Agency, the NSA, by secret executive order on November 4, 1952. Its primary purpose was to decipher the alien communications and language and to establish a dialogue with the extraterrestrials. This most urgent task was a continuation of the earlier effort. The secondary purpose of the NSA was to monitor all communications and emissions from any and all electronic devices worldwide. The NSA also maintains communications with the Luna base and other secret space programs. By executive order of the president, the NSA is exempt from all laws that do not specifically name the NSA in the text of the law as being subject to that law. That means that if the agency is not spelled out in the text of any and every law passed by Congress, it is not subject to that or those laws. The NSA now performs many other duties and in fact is the premier agency within the intelligence network. Today, the NSA receives approximately 75% of the monies allotted to the intelligence community. The old saying, where the money goes, therein the power resides, is true. The DCI today is a figurehead, maintained as a public ruse. The primary task of the NSA is still alien communications, but now includes other extraterrestrial projects as well. President Truman had been keeping our allies, including the Soviet Union, informed of the developing alien problem. This had been done in case the aliens turned out to be a threat to the human race. Plans were formulated to defend the Earth in case of invasion. Great difficulty was encountered in maintaining international secrecy. It was decided that an outside group was necessary to coordinate and control international efforts in order to hide the secret from the normal scrutiny of governments by the press. The result was the formation of a secret ruling body that became known as the Bilderberg Group. The group was formed and met for the first time in 1952. They were named after the first publicly known meeting place, the Bilderberg Hotel. That public meeting place? That public meeting took place in 1954. They were nicknamed the Bilderbergers. The headquarters of this group is Geneva, Switzerland. The Bilderbergers evolved into a secret world government that now controls everything. The United Nations was then and is now an international joke. Beginning in 1953, a new president occupied the White House. He was a man used to a structured staff organization with a chain of command. His method was to delegate authority and rule by committee. He made major decisions, but only when his advisors were unable to come to a consensus. His normal method was to read through and listen to several alternatives and then approve one. Those who worked closely with him have stated that his favorite comment was, just do whatever it takes. He spent a lot of time on the golf course. This was not unusual for a man who had been career army with the ultimate position of supreme allied commander during the war, a post that had earned him five stars. The president was general of the army, Dwight David Eisenhower. During his first year in office, 1953, at least 10 more crash discs were recovered along with 26 dead and four live aliens. Of the 10, four were found in Arizona, two in Texas, one in New Mexico, one in Louisiana, one in Montana, and one in South Africa. There were hundreds of sightings. Eisenhower knew that he had to wrestle and beat the alien problem. He knew that he could not do it by revealing the secret to Congress. Early in 1953, the new president turned to his friend and fellow member of the Council on Foreign Relations, Nelson Rockefeller. Eisenhower and Rockefeller began planning the secret structure of alien task supervision, which was to become a reality within one year. The idea for Majestic 12 was thus born. The idea for MJ-12 was thus born. From Beyond a Pale Horse, written by Bill Cooper. 
Bill Cooper writes, In 1953, astronomers discovered large objects in space that were tracked moving towards the Earth. It was first believed they were asteroids. Later evidence proved that the objects could only be spaceships. Project Sigma intercepted alien radio communications. When the objects reached the Earth, they took up a very high geosynchronous orbit around the equator. Project Sigma and a new project, Plato, through radio communications using the computer binary language, were able to arrange a landing that resulted in face-to-face -face contact with alien beings from another planet. This landing took place in the desert. The movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind is a fictionalized version of the actual events. Project Plato was tasked with establishing diplomatic relations with this race of space aliens. A hostage was left with us as a pledge that they would return and formalize a treaty. In the meantime, a race of humanoid aliens landed at Homestead Air Force Base in Florida and successfully communicated with the U.S. government. This group warned us against the race orbiting the equator and offered to help us with our spiritual development. They demanded that we dismantle and destroy our nuclear weapons as the major condition. They refused to exchange technology, citing that we were spiritually unable to handle technology we already possessed. These overtures were rejected on the grounds that it would be foolish to disarm in the face of such an uncertain future. A third landing at Murak, now Edwards Air Force Base, took place in 1954. The base was closed for three days, and no one was allowed to enter or leave during that time. The historical event had been planned in advance. Details of a treaty had been agreed on. Eisenhower arranged to be in Palm Springs on vacation. On the appointed day, the president was spirited to the base. The excuse was given to the press that he was visiting a dentist. President Eisenhower met with the aliens on February 20, 1954, and a formal treaty between the alien nation and the United States of America was signed. Four others present at the meeting were Franklin Allen of the Hearst Newspapers, Edwin Norse of the Brookings Institute, Gerald Light of Metaphysical Research fame, and Catholic Bishop McIntyre of Los, Ange Los Angeles. Their reaction was judged as a microcosm of what the public reaction might be. Based on this reaction, it was decided that the public could not be told. Later studies confirmed the decision as sound. The treaty stated that the aliens would not interfere in our affairs, and we would not interfere in theirs. We would keep their presence on Earth a secret, they would furnish us with advanced technology and would help us in our technological development. They would not make any treaty with any other Earth nation. They could abduct humans on a limited and periodic basis for the purpose of medical examination and monitoring of our development with the stipulations that the humans would not be harmed, would be returned to the point of abduction, would have no memory of the event, and that the alien nation would furnish Majesty 12 with a list of all human contacts and abductees on a regularly scheduled basis. Let's repeat that. The treaty stated that the aliens could abduct humans on a limited and periodic basis for the purpose of medical examination and monitoring of our development with the stipulations that the humans would not be harmed, would be returned to the point of abduction, would have no memory of the event, and that the alien nation would furnish Majestic 12, with a list of all human contacts and abductees on a regularly scheduled basis. It was agreed that each nation would receive the ambassador of the other for as long as the treaty remained in force. It was further agreed that the alien nation and the United States would exchange 16 personnel with the purpose of learning of each other. The alien guests would remain on Earth. The human guests would travel to the alien point of origin for a specified period of time, then return at which point a reverse exchange would be made. A reenactment, reenactment of this event was dramatized in the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. It was agreed that bases would be constructed underground for the use of the alien nation and that two bases would be constructed for the joint use of the alien nation and the United States government. Exchange of technology would take place in the jointly occupied bases. 
these alien bases would be constructed under Indian reservations in the Four Corners area of Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona, and one would be constructed in an area known as Dreamland. Dreamland was a Dreamland was built in the Mojave Desert near or in a place called Yucca. More UFO sightings and incidents occur in the Mojave Desert of California than any other place in the world. All alien areas are under complete control of the Naval Department, according to the documents that I read. All personnel who work in these complexes receive their checks from the Navy through a subcontractor. The checks never make reference to the government or the Navy. Construction of the bases began immediately, but progress was slow. Large amounts of money were made available in 1957. Work continued on the Yellow Book. Project Red Light was formed and experimentation in test flying alien craft began in earnest. A super top secret facility was built on Groom Lake in Nevada in the midst of the weapons test range. It was codenamed Area 51. The installation was placed under the Department of the Navy and all personnel required a Q clearance as well as executive parentheses, presidential called majestic approval. This is ironic due to the fact that the President of the United States does not have clearance to visit the site. The alien base and exchange of technology actually took place in an area codenamed Dreamland above ground, and the underground portion was dubbed the Dark Side of the Moon. According to the documentation that I read, at least 600 alien beings actually resided full-time at this site, along with an unknown number of scientists and CIA personnel. Due to the fear of implantation, only certain people were allowed to interfere with the alien beings and those personnel were and are watched and monitored continuously. Mr. Graves, one of your main concerns is that the FAA currently does not have an official process to receive reports of UAP from pilots or others, correct? Correct. And um, in your experience, what data should the Aero program prioritize for potential collection? We have, you know, location, date, time, but are there other specific activ uh, characteristics that should be included in these reports? Certainly. Uh, I think that there's two categories that would be important. Uh, one would be kinematics and understanding the specifics of how the vehicle or objects are moving. Uh, and the second would be a more zoomed out approach of being able to uh, look at origin and destination uh, after or before the incident, as well as getting a better contextual understanding of how these uh, these objects are interacting with each other. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Be a more zoomed out approach of being able to uh, look at origin and destination uh, after or before the incident. Origin and destination. Uh I've been to Area 51. I didn't see any flying saucers. But it's a big range. There's a lot of stuff going on out there. And there's right. a lot of adjacent ranges. Uh, if you look at the Area map, actually. Area where he was. That's what he said, yeah. yeah. That's what um, he said. Area 51 and, you know, I mean, there's nothing there anymore anyway. They called us in went into the Oval Office, and Eisen, President Eisenhower was there, and Nixon, and they said, uh, we called the people in from MJ-12, from Area 51 and S-4, but uh, they told us that the government had no jurisdiction over what they were doing. So being a general, past general, you didn't tell him to go to hell without any <laughs> real good reason, you know? Mm -hmm. So he said, uh, I want you and your boss to fly out there. I want you to give him a personal message. And he says, I want you to tell them, whoever is in charge, tell them that to get in, they have this week, coming week, to get into Washington and to report to me. And if they don't, I'm gonna get the first army from Colorado and we're gonna go over, we're gonna take the base over. I don't care what kind of classified material you got. We're gonna rip this thing apart. Eisenhower was going to invade yes, Area, Area 51. 51. Yeah, with the First Army. It was agreed that bases would be constructed underground for the use of the alien nation and that two bases would be constructed for the joint use of the alien nation and the United States government. 
Exchange of technology would take place in the jointly occupied bases. These alien bases would be constructed under Indian reservations in the Four Corners area of Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona, and one would be constructed in an area known as Dreamland. Dreamland was built in the Mojave Desert. A super top secret facility was built on Groom Lake in Nevada in the midst of the weapons test range. It was codenamed Area 51. The installation was placed under the Department of the Navy. The President of the United States does not have clearance to visit the site. The alien base and exchange of technology actually took place in an area codenamed Dreamland above ground, and the underground portion was dubbed the Dark Side of the Moon. According to the documentation that I read, at least 600 alien beings actually resided full-time at this site, along with an unknown number of scientists and CIA personnel. Due to the fear of implantation, only certain people were allowed to interfere with the alien beings and those personnel were and are watched and monitored continuously. President Eisenhower was there in Nixon and they said, uh, we called the people in from MJ-12 from Area 51 and S-4, but uh, they told us that the government had no jurisdiction over what they were doing. So he said, tell them, whoever is in charge, tell them that to get in, they have this week, coming week, to get into Washington and to report to me. And if they don't, I'm going to get the first army from Colorado and we're going to go over, we're going to take the base over. I don't care what kind of classified material you got. We're going to rip this thing apart. Eisenhower was going to invade yes, Area, Area 51. 51. Yeah, with the First Army. I'd been to Area 51. I didn't see any flying saucers or anything like that. What did you see? <laughs> I saw uh, Defense Department uh, uh, experiments being performed and, and training activities and that sort of thing. Nothing that the taxpayer would... Uh, uh, object to, but of course um, not. Talked about we're going to go to Area 51, and you know, I mean, there's nothing there anymore anyway. I've been to Area 51. I didn't see any flying saucers or anything like that. But it's a big range. There's a lot of stuff going on out there, and there's right. a lot of adjacent ranges. Uh, if you look at the Area map, actually, where he was, that's what he said. Yeah. yeah. That's what um, he said. Los Alamos officials told us they had no records of a Robert Lazar ever working there. They were either mistaken or were lying. A 1982 phone book from the lab lists Lazar right there among the other scientists and technicians. A 1982 clipping from the Los Alamos newspaper profiled Lazar and his interest in jet cars. It too mentioned his employment at the lab as a physicist. We called Los Alamos again. An exasperated official told us he still had no records on Lazar. EG&G, which is where Lazar says he was interviewed for the job at S4, also has no records. It's as if someone has made him disappear. Well, they're trying to make me a non-person. Explain. You called where? Well, the schools that I went to, the hospital that I was born at, uh, past job, and uh, essentially nothing comes up with my name in it. He smiles, but out of futility, knowing the whole thing must sound ridiculous. According to Lazar, his employer was the United States Navy. All alien areas are under complete control of the Naval Department, according to the documents that I read. All personnel who work in these complexes receive their checks from the Navy through a subcontractor. The checks never make reference to the government or the Navy. He says he and other government employees would gather near EG&G, fly to Groom Lake, and then a very few people would get into a bus with blacked out or no windows and drive to S4. When you get off the bus, what do you see? It's a very interesting building. It's got a slope of probably about 30 degrees, the, uh, which are hangar doors. And it has textured paint on it, but it's, it looks like sand. It's made to look like the side of the mountain that it's in, whether it's to disguise it from satellite photographs or what. It was agreed that bases would be constructed underground for the use of the alien nation and that two bases would be constructed for the joint use of the alien nation and the United States government. Exchange of technology would take place in the jointly occupied bases. These alien bases would be constructed under Indian reservations in the Four Corners area of Utah, 
Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona, and one would be constructed in an area known as Dreamland. Dreamland was built in the Mojave Desert. A super top secret facility was built on Groom Lake in Nevada in the midst of the weapons test range. It was codenamed Area 51. The installation was placed under the Department of the Navy, and all personnel required a Q clearance as well as executive presidential majestic approval. This is ironic due to the fact that the President of the United States does not have clearance to visit the site. The alien base and exchange of technology actually took place in an area codenamed Dreamland above ground, and the underground portion was dubbed the Dark Side of the Moon. According to the documentation that I read, at least 600 alien beings actually resided full-time at this site, along with an unknown number of scientists and CIA personnel. Dreamland was built in the Mojave Desert. He says he and other government employees would gather near EG&G, fly to Groom Lake, and then a very few people would get into a bus with blacked out or no windows and drive to S4. I'd been to Area 51. I didn't see any flying saucers. But it's a big range. There's a lot of stuff going on out there, and there's right. a lot of adjacent ranges. Uh, if you look at Area the map, S4, actually, where he was. That's what he said, yeah. yeah. That's what um, he said. Area 51 and, you know, I mean... There's nothing there anymore anyway. They called us in, went into the old office, and Eisen, President Eisenhower was there and Nixon, and they said, uh, we called the people in from MJ-12 from Area 51 and S-4, but uh, they told us that the government had no jurisdiction over what they were doing. So being a general, past general, you didn't tell them to go to hell without any <laughs> real good reason, you know. Mm -hmm. So he said, uh, I want you and your boss to fly out there. I want you to give them a personal message. And he says, I want you to tell them, whoever is in charge, Tell them that to get in, they have this week, coming week, to get into Washington and to report to me. And if they don't, I'm going to get the first army from Colorado and we're going to go over, we're going to take the base over. I don't care what kind of classified material you got. We're going to rip this thing apart. Eisenhower was going to invade yes, Area, Area 51. 51. Yeah, with the First Army. So you go out with your superior. Yes. You fly out. You land. What happens? Can you describe this whole process? What you saw? It took us the 13 or 15 miles south to S4 and like different garage door openings. And in these garage door openings, they had like different saucer crafts. The very first one had uh, the uh, Roswell craft in. It was kind of crashed up. When you get off the bus, what do you see? It's a very interesting building. It's got a slope of probably about 30 degrees, the, uh, which are hangar doors. And it has textured paint on it, but it's, it looks like sand. It's made to look like the side of the mountain that it's in, whether it's to disguise it from satellite photographs or what. The first inkling I had was when I, I came in. Normal, there's this facility that is at S4. It's in the side of a mountain. And normally we had pulled in with the bus and gone around the front through a normal double door. This time that I went in, there were hangar doors open. I went in through the hangar door, and in the hangar door was the disc, the flying saucer that I worked on. I saw it sitting there, and we walked by it. It had a little American flag stuck on the side, and I thought, oh, my God, this finally explains all the flying saucer stories. This is just an advanced fighter, and it, this is fucking hilarious. Right. So I went by. I slid my hand alongside it. I got reprimanded immediately for touching the thing. And uh, there was a guy, an armed guard, that followed us in and just said, keep your eyes at forward and your hands at your side and just walk in the door. If they don't, 
I'm going to get the first army from Colorado, and we're going to go over. We're going to take the base over. I don't care what kind of classified material you got. We're going to rip this thing apart. Eisenhower was going to invade yes, Area, Area 51. 51. Yeah, with the first army. It, so who gets to decide this, in your opinion, in the past? Uh, it's a group of career uh, senior executive officials. Okay, are they government officials? Both or in and out. Do what? Both in and out of government, and that's about as far I as got I can you. go there. Yeah. All right, well, that's, it leads to my next question. Which private corporations are directly involved in this program? Uh, the specific corporations I did provide uh, to the committees in specific divisions, and uh, I spent 11 and a half hours with both intel committees. So. Okay, has there been any, has there been an active U.S. government disinformation campaign to deny the existence of unidi unidentified aerial phenomena, and if so, why? I can't go beyond what I've already espoused publicly about that. ...guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals, so that security and liberty may prosper together. It, so who gets to decide this, in your opinion, in the past? Uh, it's a group of career uh, senior executive officials. Okay, are they government officials? Both or in and out. Do what? Both in and out of government, and that's about as far I as I can go there.